Ladies and gentlemen, the rabbi just mentioned about watching and keeping an eye on United's flights this afternoon. So once the rabbi went there, I'd like to just tell you that I was the second to the last flight out of Newark, New Jersey. All the rest were canceled. So I'm sitting on the plane and I tell my wife, we're about to take off. And she said, what? Your flight wasn't canceled? I said, no. She said, you see, Borei Olam, he really wanted you to give this share tonight. So if you think that these decisions come about and we decide, you know, maybe today I decide to go to Florida. Hashem has a plan and a place on every moment of life that each and every one of us ventures with incredible purpose and direction. And tonight it was my honor for my purpose and plan to be spending a few minutes right here with you. I want to open up tonight with a life-changing yesod. This is a concept that I'm hoping is going to elevate your Elul and it'll never be the same again. To the extent that this Elul will be memorable and so too the great holidays that are going to follow. And I know those are big words. And it's a little bit foolish. A speaker gets up, stands in front of an audience that he meets not every day, and he raises the bar that high. A little bit on the foolish side. But when it comes to the truth of standing in front of a tzibor after so many years, I realized that it has nothing to do with me. Borei Olam is the one that gives the words. Borei Olam is the one that gives the siyata dishmaya. It's the way he wants it is the way it comes out. And it's the words that he puts into your hearts. And if that's the case, he's one to bank on. And I could raise that bar as high as I, as I want. And Hashem can do everything. Ladies and gentlemen, open your hearts. The great rabbi in Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Berkowitz, he was known to tell his Talmudim, and many of my brothers are actually students of his, that today in our generation, there is a little bit of an anxiety, a pachat, that comes with the month of Elul, but not like once upon a time in old generations. In old generations, when they just heard the announcement of Elul, they would begin to tremble. Yom Adin, Yom Adin, the great judgment day is coming. But our generation, the rabbi learns that the understanding of the pachad of Elul is a little bit different today. And I want to I want to give this over. Do you know what the anxiety and pachad of the month of Elul in our times? It's the fear of losing out on a great opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no greater opportunity like the month of Elul. An opportunity is knocking. And it's up to us to really answer. And to lose out on that incredible opportunity brings a certain anxiety. I have so much to gain now. Am I going to really take this for everything it's worth? That is the beauty, but the opportunity, of this great month of Elul. A very close friend of mine is in contact with a Lubavitcher rabbi out in Short Hills, New Jersey. Now, if you heard this story before, I'm already asking apologies in advance. I ran it for a moment past the rabbi. He told me he doesn't remember it. I'm hoping I'm in the clear. It, 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 you want to talk about anxiety and pachat? You know what it is to stand up in front of people and say, oh my gosh, I bet they heard that one already. Oh my gosh, I bet. They're... So I'm hoping, but yet, Hashem, let's get to the story. A good friend of mine, very close to a Lubavitcher rabbi out in Short Hills, New Jersey. Now this rabbi, when he came to Short Hills, nobody in the community was religious. So he literally started with maybe two people. But then little by little, he was very charismatic and he had a lot to offer. The people loved him. So little by little, his little shul started to fill up with people and eventually he started to actually even have a minyan. There was one Russian boy that came very close to this rabbi. Matter of fact, the rabbi made him religious. 
After that, the rabbi introduced him to a young lady that the rabbi's wife made religious. And after they went out a few times, they got engaged. And this was a big thing. This was the first shidduch, the first shidduch that was made by the rabbi and the little town of Short Hills, New Jersey was about to enjoy. So everyone was talking, wow, we're going to have this beautiful wedding here in Short Hills. Well, the wedding night came and the rabbi understood that this young Russian boy, the Chatan, you know, he left his friends of old and entered a whole new religious life. He was worried, you know, how many people are going to show up to this wedding? So the rabbi took upon himself that right when it starts the dancing, he's going to make sure to get around the room and make sure that every single person that shows up is going to dance. Men, women, and children, everyone's dancing. The men with the chatan, the ladies with the kala, but there's going to be no people sitting at this wedding. Everyone's dancing, and they're going to make it really sameach. So sure enough, right after the chuppah, the rabbi, after they announced the chatan and kala, presenting for the very first time, da 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 the chatan and kala, come dancing in the room, and he goes to the men, and she goes to the ladies, and now the rabbi holds true to his cause. He starts running around the tables, and he's pulling people out of chairs. Come on, let's give the chatan the night of his life. Come on, let's really give him a real Lebedika wedding. And he's pulling people off of chairs. And he literally got every guy in the place to dance with the chatan and the girls with the kala, except one. There was one old man that was sitting on a chair in back of the room. And he just wouldn't move. And the rabbi runs up to him with the gusto and he says, come on, let's go give the chatan the night of his life. And the old man says, no, no, rabbi, rabbi, please, please, I can't. I can't get up. I can't move. He says, come on, you're not that old. I can see the young man in you. Step up, let's go. Let's make it a real chatan wedding. He says, no, no, rabbi, you don't understand. Let me explain it to you. Rabbi, I'm the Chatan's grandfather. He says, oh, really? It's a pleasure to meet you. He says, yeah, yeah, but Rabbi, let me explain to you something. You know, you made my grandson religious, and I can't thank you enough. And when my grandson heard that the chuppah that he's going to stand under with his wife-to-be is a place of incredible holiness, he came to me and he said to me, Grandpa, I love you. But I just learned that the canopy that hangs over the head of Chatan and Kala is the Shekhinah, God's presence, that actually wraps Kivyachol, his arms, around Chatan and Kala and starts their marriage with whatever they need. I don't want to lose that holiness. Grandpa, I know that you were never circumcised. You came from the USSR, you came from Russia. Grandpa, I'm sorry, please, can you do this for me? And I told my grandson, I'll do whatever he needs. The rabbi looked at him and said, what? Seriously? He says, yes, seriously. So, so wait one second, so what happened? He says, rabbi, this morning, the morning of my grandson's wedding, I had my Brit Mila. The rabbi looked at him and said, are you joking? He says, no, I'm not joking. I mean it. This morning, the whole nine yards, the sandak, the mohel, the whole thing. I'm 87 years old. And I had my Brit Mila this morning. The rabbi says, this is, this is, this is too much. I cannot believe what you're telling me. He says, yes, I did it. I did it for my grandson. And sure enough, I turned to my grandson this afternoon, the day of his wedding, and I said, my son, I'm giving you the greatest wedding present that anyone has ever given someone they loved. I can't give you more than this, but I will never miss the opportunity to stand under the chuppah on the night of your wedding. My grandson turned to tears. And Rabbi, you saw tonight, 
When it came time for the chuppah, they put me in a wheelchair and they rolled me straight up to the chuppah and very gently they brought me under the chuppah and I stood under the canopy with my grandson and his beautiful bride and that was the wedding present. I did it for him. The rabbi was like, wow. I mean, I thought I heard everything in my life, but this is a first. That is amazing. He says, but Rabbi, please understand, I can't move. So I understand you got everybody to dance, and that's beautiful. But please, could you just let me sit? Could you, could, could, could you just let me be? The rabbi says, yeah, 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 you have a tour. It's, it's, it's okay. You could just sit right here. But then the rabbi turns to the man, and he says to him, but you're in your 80s. You must be in such pain. The rabbi reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out an envelope. And on the envelope it says, Lubavitch Rebbe, 1977. The, man tur the rabbi turns to the old man and says, listen, many years ago, I was by the Lubavitch Rebbe and his Fabrengen. And you know, when the rabbi would finish speaking, people would get on a line by 770 in the Eastern Parkway, and they would come around, and the rebbe would give each person a dollar bill. He says, when I was a little, little, little boy, I was coming around on that line in 1977, and I came in front of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he handed me this dollar, and when the Rebbe handed me the dollar, he said, this should be a refuah shalema. And I said, says the rabbi, refuah shalema, I was a little boy, and I felt fine. Why is he handing me? And I said to myself, you know, probably he wants me to give it to someone one day who needs a refuah shalema. So I took that dollar bill and I put it in an envelope and I wrote on it, Lubavitcher Rebbe, 1977, and I put it inside my pocket and I've been carrying it for years, looking for the right person who really needs a refuah shalema. And grandpa, if there was anyone that could use a refuah shalema in his 80s, that he had his circumcision, it's you. He, the, the rabbi pulls out the dollar bill. He rips open the envelope. He pulls out the dollar and he hands it to the old man. And the old man's hands is shaking. And he takes the dollar bill and he begins to cry. And he says, thank you. You don't know what this means to me. And the rabbi looked at the old man and says, oh, wow, you're crying. He says, no, you don't understand, rabbi. Over 50 years ago, says the old grandfather, I came here to the United States from Russia. And the night I landed in JFK airport, my brother-in-law took me out to see the Grand Rabbiner, the big rabbi in America. He brought me to the Labavitch Rebbe, says the grandfather. And he says, just like you said, when the rabbi was finished giving his dirasha, everyone got on the line and they started going around the room. And each person that walked by the Rebbe, the Rebbe glanced at them for a moment and handed them a dollar bill. Says the grandfather, when it came my turn and I stood in front of the Lubavitch Rebbe, I smiled and the Rebbe looked at me and he asked me in Russian, do you have Brit Mila? And he pulled back the dollar. He says, I looked at the Rebbe and I said, we were, I, I just came from Russia. I, I never had the opportunity. The Rebbe smiled. The Rebbe placed the dollar in my hand, says the grandfather, and closed my hand and held my hand. And he said to me, here, take this dollar bill. And the day you have Brit Mila, I'll give you another dollar. Opportunity. Opportunity, Rabotai. Listen to me, open your hearts. When the opportunity is there and it's knocking, don't let 50 years go by to wonder, why didn't I jump on the moment? What if? My year could have been so much different. My life could have been so much different. I could have capitalized on so many challenges, so many areas. So many difficulties, if I would have just used the opportunity at the moment that it posed itself. And here 
we are. I got on a plane in the middle of a tropical storm, which I think is something that you guys know about. And I, and, and, and I jumped onto United and I came out here to Florida tonight on a one-nighter to just go back tomorrow to scream one word, opportunity. Elu, Ani le dodi, ve dodi li. Hashem says, I want to be close to you. All year I've been waiting for this closeness. I'm giving you this month an opportunity like no other month ever held. Do you want it? Because opportunity is knocking. Chaval. To lose this tremendous opportunity. And he's not asking for a lot. He's asking just for a little bit. A little bit of a better tefillah, a little bit of a more of a kiviut of learning, a little bit more of a seriousness when it comes to scaling my performance in Avodat HaKodesh. To be honest with oneself, to find out do I have purpose? Am I living to be great, to do great things in Klal Yisrael? Am I living for me or am I living for we? Where am I? Introspection. Very intimate moment between me and myself on the opportunity of time that Borei Olam steps up and says, I'm here to help you conquer. What do you want to do together? I'm closer than ever now. Let's do it. Let's grab this opportunity. Can we take a step back for a minute? I'd like to talk to you about the holiest man in the world on the holiest day of the year in the holiest place on earth. <laughs> I'm talking about the Kohen Gadol going on Yom Kippur, Lifnai V'Lifnim, into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. One day a year, talking about opportunity. One day a year, that door opens. And do you know what he does when he comes in there? Well, every year in Musaf, we sing it, we read it, we cry with it. We actually act it out. It's called the Avodah of the Kohanim. Avodat Kohanim. We actually trace the steps of the Kohanim, the Kohen Gadol, as he enters the Kodesh Kodashim. And there is the moment of Kapara. What a moment. What a moment of incredible purity. The moment that we get forgiven for our sins. You know what happens at that moment? He takes the blood and he sprays achat lemala v'sheva lemata. He sprays one above the kaporet and seven below the kaporet. And once he does this incredible moment of zrika spraying one above and seven below, at that moment he counts. But now, listen to the way he counts. Everybody might know this a little bit in the way of a song. You might be singing it now in your mind. Honestly, I would sing it together with you. But the Ben Shushans aren't singers we speak. So I'm going to say it. <laughs> and you're going to sing it. And together we'll feel it. Because that's really what my end game is. How does he count? V'kach haya mone. Ahat. That's when he sprays one above. And then when it comes to the seven below, how does he count? Ahat ve ahat, ahat ve shtayim, ahat ve shalosh, ahat ve arba, ahat ve chamesh, ahat ve shesh, ahat ve sheva. That's the way he counts. Asks the Gemara, isn't that a little bit of a weird way to count? You know, when he counts the one above, we get it, ahat. But when he comes to count the seven below, wouldn't it be just simple to just go ahat, shtaim, shalosh, arba, hane, she, sheva? What is this ahat ve ahat, bless you? Ahat ve shtaim, ahat ve shalosh, ahat ve arba. What, what is this funny way of counting? One on one, one on two, one on three, one on four, one on five, one on six, one on seven. What, what is that? What's this one on? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you, please, open your hearts. You're going to hear a Yisod tonight. This is a Yisod that was given over to us to none other than Ramosha Isolish, 
Zechet Sadik Lebracha, better known to Klal Yisrael as the Rama. The Rama in Shulchan Aruch. Can I stop for a minute just to give you a little background about the greatness of the Rama? Do you know that the Rama spent his lifetime working on what would have been the Shulchan Aruch, the code of law, the book that codified all Jewish law for the Jewish people. He spent his whole life working on the book of Shulchan Aruch. He came from the countries of Ashkenaz and he put down all the halachot, the way you would expect the Shulchan Aruch, a book that codified law would look. Do you know that he was almost finished his life's masterpiece? It was almost finished. And he hears that there was another rabbi on the other side of the continent that beat him to it. And he already put out a Shulchan Aruch V'Klal Yisrael. And that rabbi, as we all know, was the great Maran Yosef Cairo Zechet Tzadik Lebracha. Maran Bet Yosef. He only beat him by a half a year. Do you know that? The Rama was a half a year away from finishing the Shulchan Aruch. And Maran Bet Yosef put it out six months prior. So now, ladies and gentlemen, if we were to put ourselves in the shoes of the Rama, what would you do? You spent your whole life on a project. You spent your whole life on writing this book. Okay, somebody else put it out first. So you know what? He put out the Sephardic Book of Law because he lived in the Sephardic countries. The Rama could have simply just said, I'll put out the Ashkenazic version of the Shulchan Aruch codified laws. What's the problem? But he didn't do that. Do you want to watch what humility is at its greatest? You want to watch the greatness of what a rabbi is? The Rama took a step back and he said, if I put out a second Shulchan Aruch, it's going to look like that there's two Torot in Klal Yisrael, God forbid. So I'd rather humble myself. I'd rather go into second position. I'm not going to be the Mechaber anymore. I'm going to be the Haga'a. I'm going to be the fine print. I'm going to allow him to be the bold big letters, the actual author of Shulchan Aruch, and I'm simply going to be the footnote of the great Maram Bet Yosef. Do you understand what type of humility, what type of humble great giant of a man this Rama must have been just to do that, his life's work? And he moved himself into second position and humbled himself so that Klal Yisrael will have one Shulchan Aruch, one perfect work. Now I'm going to tell you what the Ramah said and how he answers this great question that we asked, the Kohen Gadol, and the funny way that he counted. Achat lemala, one above, v'sheva lamata, achat v'achat, achat v'shtayim, achat v'shalosh. And we asked the Gimana's question, this is such a weird way to count. One on one, one on two, one on three, what's going on? Answers the Raman, his book, Torah Ta'ola, something fascinating, fascinating. The Gemaran Sukkah Nun Bet tells us that the Yetzer Hara has seven names. Oh boy. He made enough problems with one name. He has seven names. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God called him Ra. Moshe Rabbeinu called him Arel. David called him Tameh. Each one called him a different name until finally, finally the last of the Nevi'im, I believe it was Yoel that called him Tzfoni, which is like a viper, a deadly snake. Seven different names. He was called Evan. He was all different names. He has seven different names. Says the Chida. What does that mean he has seven different names? You know, it reminds me of one of those little uh, boiler operations in, uh, in, uh, back in Brooklyn that, you know, they get in trouble, so they go bankrupt and open up under a new LLC, right? 
And they keep opening up on a new name. No, but, but now you see maybe where it came from. Anyways, but this Yetzer Hara has seven different names. And each time he opens up under a new name, what's the deal? Why does he need seven names? Says the Chida, his seven names really describes his seven different techniques in the way he makes people fall. He has seven different tricks in his hat of rabbits. He has seven different techniques. That was a word from our sponsor. We have seven different techniques, the Yetzer Hara, to be able to get people to fall. And each name represents a different way that he gets people to sin. Sometimes he comes with this name. Another time will come with that name. And even if you beat him with one name, he'll come back with a different technique and next day the same. Do you remember that famous story? That incredible night, Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, he went back for Pachim Ktanim and he, he was jumped by the Tsar of Esav, the Samach Mem, the Malchamavet, the Yetzer Hara, same guy. And they fought and they wrestled all night long until the morning star, Ad Alot HaShachar. And then finally Yaakov Avinu bested him because... There's nothing in the world that beats the Yetzer Hara better than Torah. That's right. That's why we're opening a high school in this community. Because the Torah is going to flourish. We're going to get to that in a moment. Yaakov Avinu bests the Yetzer Hara. And he puts him in a chokehold, so to speak. And he doesn't let him go. And at that moment, Yaakov Avinu says to the angel, Ma Shemecha, what's your name? And you know what the angel answers? Lama Zeh. Tish'al Lishmi. What are you asking me my name? Now, what's going on here? This is a little bit of a very weird back and forth. They're uh, trading business cards. What's, what, what's the deal? What's your name? And he goes back and he answers him. What does it matter what my name is? Yaakov Avinu, you know exactly who this is. This is the Tsar of Esav. This is the Malach Hamavet. You've been rolling in the dust and fighting with him all night long. You finally beat him. You know who your adversary, your enemy is. And you're asking him his name? Yes. Shemo Ken Hu. A person's name describes their essence. If you want to know the essence of the makeup of a person, find out their name because that's their description. Did you ever have it that somebody went to Israel and they came to a great Mikubal, a tzaddik, a rabbi, and they handed him a name of a person. And the rabbi just looks at the name, never met the person before in his life. And all of a sudden he starts telling you everything about the person as if they knew him forever. Because once they look at the name, the name says it all about you. The name is your makeup and your essence. And if that's the case, says Yaakov Avinu to the Tsar of Esav, Mashemecha, I know who you are, but what's your name? What is your essence? What is your strength? What are your tricks? What are your kohot? I want to know what makes you tick so that I can tell my children and they'll know for generations to come how to beat you. And you know what he answers? Lama zetish alishmi. What does it matter what my name is today? Tomorrow I'll just come back at you with a new name. Today I'm gonna come at you with communism. But tomorrow I'll come at you with socialism. And then the next generation fascism. And then later on, it'll be social media. And maybe it'll be Instagram, it'll be Facebook. It'll be all different types of tricks that he has up his sleeve. And today you might beat him in one area, but tomorrow he'll just come back at you with a different name. He has seven different names. And that's why the Gemara calls him a Zvuv. You know why he's called the fly? Because the fly comes buzzing this way and you swat at him on this side. Does he give up? Does he kish? Never! He comes to the other side and then you swat him in that way and then he takes a different angle and a different side and a different... That's the Yetzer Hara. One day he's hitting you with Ra. The next day he's hitting you Arel. The third day he's hitting you Evan. The next day he's hitting you Tzvoni. Different names, different techniques, different tricks. And ladies and gentlemen, if I can just 
pause for a moment for station identification. If you understand what our kids are up against today, you'll understand that they're up against what we, when we were kids, were not up against. You see, the Yitzhak Hara when we were kids was one name. But where our kids are up against today is a completely different name. And you must make peace with that. Because if you don't make peace with that, you're talking to your child a language of old to the ears of young. And it's like speaking a language of yesterday's Yetzer Hara that you think you understand what their trials and tribulations are up against. And they look at you and laugh and say, really? You think that that's what the problems are? <laughs> We need a high school. We need Rebbies. Rebbies that speak the language of the boys. That they understand the way they tick. They understand the hearts of what makes the boys today interested, giving them purpose and direction. If our boys today aren't looking forward to go back to school the next day, there's something wrong with our chinuch. We need to create a school that is not there for the image of the school, but is there for the needs of the boys. My Rebbe once told me years ago that every institution is in the form of its creator. And that's why this world is godly. But this institution, you have people like our own Rabbi Galamidi Shalita. Have you met somebody warmer in your life? When he calls, I say na'asev nishma. Be'emet. It's someone that I love with an entire heart. I have a tremendous respect the warmth that's coming from Rabbi Galamidi when we're starting this wonderful high school, the warmth that's going to come from Eli Levy as a president that's standing up and continuing Avodat HaKodesh, the warmth that comes from guys like David Zornana. These are Amudim that are standing and holding up communities, shuls, and visions. But let me explain it to you. It's a vision that's going to be like a hand-tailored suit for the specifications of the child and not vice versa. We need warm Rebbies today. We really do. Do you know what we're going up against? Do you know what our kids are going up against? Do you know that our kids are out there on social media and my gosh, they're a rock star in the cyber world. Every time they put something up and out there, they get 10,000 likes from, from 10,000 different people. They feel like a million bucks. And it comes to a point where they say, you know what? Out there, they love me. How come in school, how come at home, I seem to be a burden and a pressure and a problem? To everyone I'm around. And little by little, who do you think that this kid is going to follow eventually? We're losing the war because we don't even understand the name we're fighting. We don't even understand the battlefield. We don't get what we're up against. Today, we need to be bigger than social media. Do you believe that? Today, we got to be Hollywood. We got to come up with the special effects. We got to come up with the magic. We got to create a yeshiva that's built on so much warmth and so much love, and they understand the boys, and they make them feel like all-stars, so that they'll feel more loved in the places they should be than the likes of fake in the places that are going after them. Welcome to the war. That's the battlefield of today. And if there was ever people that were warm enough to imbue a certain love, to put out to the hearts, to be Moshech, please understand this, to be Moshech the boys. 
Here is the legendary line. Live by this line. This is a line to take home to your chinuch. This is a line to take home to your relationships, home to your children. And let's plaster this all over the walls of our schools. Reach before you teach. One line, but that's our door. Reach him before you teach him. Could you imagine a Rebbe and a Talmud, a Rebbe and a student? It's like two countries and there are oceans between them. Can you open up commerce between two countries without building a bridge first? We need master bridge builders as Rebbe's who understand how to build the bridges between them and the hearts of their boys, of their students. And then once you have them, oh my gosh, once you have them, you could teach them anything you want. You can take your scholastic levels through the roof. But don't forget the Aleph. The Satmar Rebbe used to say right after the Holocaust, he had a little stable in the Lower East Side and he sat with a bunch of people and they went through the Gemara and it was a Gemara Shir. Can you believe it? A Gemara Shir. The Satmar Rebbe, Rebbe Yoel, he sat there with all Holocaust survivors. He opens up the Gemara to Davbet the first day and he turns to the first guy on the table. What city, what town did you come from? How many people did you lose in the war? What town did you come from? What concentration camp did you lose your parents to? And he went around the room, person after person, and he would cry with them. And then once he finished, he closed the Gemara. Share over. Share over. Yeah, the share is over. And he'd come back the next day, the Satmar Rebbe, and he'd open up the Gemara to the first page, and he'd start the share. He'd turn to the guy and say, so tell me, how many children did you lose in the war? And he'd go around the circle again. And he would do this day after day. Finally, one guy in the shir said, huh, Rebbe, are we going to ever learn any Gemara? And the Rebbe looked at him, the Satmar Rebbe, with furrowed eyes. And with all seriousness, he tells him, what do you mean? Till now we were learning Daf Aleph. Now we'll learn Daf Bet. Eli, you understand now what type of school we need to create. We need a school that teaches Daf Aleph before Daf Bet. And you know who Daf Aleph is? The boys. Connect to them. Make them feel like all-stars. Make them feel that they have everything going for them and they're gems. Because they are gems. They're our gems. We have nothing in this world that's more precious than them. And once you connect to them like that, you can send them to the moon. You can give them all the Torah, all the scholastic, all the, anything you want. But there's a connection. That's the way we win in the generation of today's name of the Yetzirah. Lama ze tish'al lishmi, says the Yetzirah. What are you asking me my name of today, even if you beat me tomorrow? I'll just come back with another name. I'll just come back with another technique. And this is the way we're coming back at him. And if this is the case, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to our shtickle Torah. Forgive me, I really digress this time. But we're asking a question. The question was, the Kohen Gadol, when he would spray, and he would count, one above, and then seven below, Achat v'achat, achat v'shtayim, achat v'shalosh. And we ask, what is he doing? Why is he counting in such a funny way? One on one, one on two, one on three. Says the Rama, an amazing idea. Do you know who the achat l'mala is? There's only one echad l'mala. And that is Hashem echad, u'shmo echad. The Kohen Gadol walks in, l'fnai v'lefnim. Yom Kippur, Kodesh Kodashim. And here's the moment of Kapara. You know how he gets to Kapara? He first prays to the one above. Echad Lemala. He connects to the one above. And then he takes that Echad Lemala and he puts it on the seven names of the Eight Sahara Lamata. And he goes, Echad Vehat. I take the Echad Lemala and I knock out the first name of the Eight Sahara. 
אחד ושתיים. I take the אחד למעלה, knock out the second name מייצר הרע. אחת ושלוש, אחת וארבע, אחת וחמש, אחת ושש, אחת ושבע. And like this, he knocks out all seven powers of the seven-headed dragon called Yetzer Hara, and he vanquished the dragon. And now the Yetzer Hara is completely wiped out on the day of Yom HaKippurim, and that's the moment that we get incredible kapara. What an amazing idea. I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself. Achat lemala, v'sheva lemata. Connect to the achat lemala. And then you do like the Kohen Gadol will do. You take the achat and put it on the achat. Take the Echad and put it on the second name of the Yetzirah. Echad and put it on the third name of the Yetzirah. Echad and put it on the fourth name. And knock out all seven names. With the Echad Lamala, we knock out the seven Lamata. And that's how Yom Kippur is the day of absolute kapara and purity. Because the Sahara is knocked out on all seven levels. And it's because of this that the Ketav Sofer writes that this was the biggest limud zechut for the Jewish people. Think about it. Kohen Gadol goes into the holiest of holies and he announces, Echad lamala v'sheva lamata. He says, Hashem, we have echad, we have only one thing pulling us upwards, but we have seven things pulling us downward. This was milamed zechut. Look what we're going up against, says Kohen Gadol. We need your help, Abba. We need to connect with you. We need you to take up our fight. If you fight with us, we can knock out the first name of the Yetzirah, Echad ve'echad. If you fight for us, we can knock out the second name, Yetzirah, Echad v'shtayim, Echad v'shalosh. But we need you to take up our fight. And that is the opportunity of Elul. Ani l'dodi v'dodili. I connect with the Echad Lemala. He takes up my fight. We become one. And then I can knock out all Sheva Lamata. Unbelievable. You know, the Imre Emet used to say, if people would understand what mitzvot are, it would blow their minds. They think that they're just going through the routine of every morning, I wake up, wash my hands, I do mode'ani, I come to shul, I put on my tefillin, all right. Would you believe that when you put on your tefillin, did you ever stop for a minute to think that you do echad lamala v'sheva lemata? Says the Imre Emet, every day we have an opportunity through the mitzvot to knock out all seven names of the Eight Sahara. And that's the way we start the day. We knock them out bright and early in the morning. Like this, the rest of the day, we can fly, we can flourish. But the only way to do that is with the mindset of understanding what I am doing. I put on a pair of tefillin and I think to myself, the left hand is judgment. The right hand is mercy. I'm going to take the mercy and I'm going to tie down the judgment and I'm going to do it with Echad Lamala. I'm going to connect to the one above so that he'll help me knock out Sheva Lamata. Unreal. Now I can start my day. Now I can conquer. Now, now I'm ready for the day. Look how much is there. Look how much Hashem helps us. Il male hakadish baruchu beozro lo yachol lo. That's what the Gemara tells us. If not for the fact that God helps us in our fight and takes up our fight and fights with us, fights for us, we would never be able to knock him out. This seven-headed dragon is way too ferocious. But this is the month that he takes up our fight. Elu, ani dodi. So we spend these days 
connecting on the opportunity of closeness to come closer to Hashem, that moment we become one with God, He takes up our fight, and now is the countdown of 40 days of connection that works on the final blow on day 40, Yom Kippur, we make it to Echad Lemala, the Sheva Lamata, and we knock out all seven names, Yetzer Hara, and we get the greatest Kapara of the year. And this you didn't see coming. And here is the beauty of the night. Because if you don't believe me that this is the Avodah of Elul, Elul doesn't just stand for Anili Dodi Vidodili. Elul stands for Echa Lemala Vesheva Lemata. This is the opportunity. I'm ready to fight for you. I just want to know if you want to connect to me. Plug into me, says Bore Olam. Anili Dodi Vidodili. Plug into me. So I can fight for you. But we can turn an Elul of closeness into an Elul of Echad Lamala, Besheva Lamata, to come to the 40th day, to vanquish and knock out Yetzer Hara completely in order to get an absolute Kapara and the greatest judgment for the coming year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to maybe just end off with a personal story. No, I, I feel bad. I will tell you, I'm going over the time. Uh, no, 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 that's. Uh, I feel bad. I feel bad. Uh, I'm, I'm the last guy to stand between you and your supper. Believe me, I know my place. Rabbi should not put himself between people and food. It's it's a bad, bad place to be. That's not the mechitza you want to be in life. There are better mechitza to fight for. Okay. This past summer was a challenging one for me and my brothers. My father, who came over at a very young age to the Mir Yeshiva with a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Avram Kamenovich, Zechit Sadik Bracha, he had such foresight, this rabbi. He saw what the Alliance was doing to the young Moroccan boys. And he got on a boat and he went out to Morocco in the 50s and he gathered a group of boys together to bring them back to the Muri Yeshiva at the age of 13 years old. Could you imagine that? You know, I have a daughter. The first time I sent her away to sleepaway camp for one month, for one month. And I was standing there by the, uh, by the Greyhound bus when I was putting her up to send her off to camp. I was crying like a little baby. And I'm thinking to, my, <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm sending my little daughter away. She's 13 and it's for a month and I can call her. And I'm getting separation anxiety. How did my grandmother send my father away at the age of 13, 6,000 miles away, with a rabbi that she never met, to a Muri Yeshiva that she knew nothing about, just for the sake of Torah? And I asked my grandmother that. When I went to learn in Israel for five and a half years, I used to go Shabbatot to my grandma, my grandmother. We used to call her Mama, right? And, so, and I used to come to Mama's house, spend Shabbat, and then Friday night, she would tell me over the stories of the old country of Morocco and all the amazing, incredible stories that she would tell us about the family in Sadiqim. And then I would ask her, Mama, I don't get it. What were you thinking? You sent your son, 13 years old, with a rabbi to America. I mean, like, from where to where? And she said to me, we come from a family of rabbis. Hashem blessed me with seven sons. I had to make sure that one of my sons continue in the Torah for the family's sake. She says, I was walking through the street. I saw this six foot two rabbi with a long white beard. I thought he was Eliyahu Navi. And if you know Moroccan women, that's pretty funny. Because they dream about Eliyahu Navi. They talk to Eliyahu Navi. They have conversations with Eliyahu Navi. They're tight with Eliyahu Navi. So when she said she saw Eliyahu Navi on the street, it was like, okay, it's Monday. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so she saw Eliyahu Navi. She said, I thought he was Eliyahu Navi. I ran up and I, I said, Chacham, in the broken Hebrew. Who are you? 
And he said he came from the Mir Yeshiva of America to bring back some boys to the United States to become rabbis. At that time, believe it or not, the plan was that they were going to make him rabbis in New York, in the Mir Yeshiva, and then they were going to ship him back to Morocco to be the future rabbis of that up-and-coming generation. But Hashem had a different plan because right after that, most of the Jews of Morocco left and went either to Israel, France, and so on and so forth, and they stayed in the United States. My father gave his life for Torah. He was Moser Nefesh, Mesirut Nefesh, that really taught a lot of us of what our jobs are supposed to be here in this world. A very selfless man. In his later years, he was struck with a very bad case of diabetes. And recently, it came to a head. This past summer was a big challenge for us. In the beginning of the summer, we were being told by the doctors in Jersey Shore that there's no chance left to save my father's left leg. There's no chance. There's no blood flow left. There's no blood flow from the knee down to the foot. There's nothing to talk about. The doctors told us after MRIs and every trick that they thought they knew that the only thing left is amputation. We shuddered. You know, we couldn't even say the word out of our mouth to each other when talking in conversation inside the family, even to think. I saw my father was very, very bothered, very hurt, very broken that the doctors just gave up on his situation. I'm sparing a lot of details because I, I, I don't want it to be too, too detailed oriented. I don't want to, God forbid, uh, but after I turned to my father and I said, Abba, listen to me. You taught us. Hashem, Ani lo yachol. I can't, I, Duvi Ben Shushan, I can't help my father and his situation of his foot. Ani lo yachol. Aval ata, kol yachol. You, Hashem, can do anything and everything. And I am relying on you. The doctors threw in the towel. They gave up. They told us straight away. We went the conventional way. We really did. We tried every test, every trick. At that point, they even took off two toes. The doctor was so convinced that they were right that when they took off one toe, they said, you see, it didn't even bleed. There's no blood. I told my father, you're going to see. The Omar lach b'damayichai. The Omar Lach B'damai Chayi, you're going to see. I said, Abba, you taught us. You taught us. Borei Olam can do anything. You just have to really rely on him. we got to go back to the Bitachon. And right there in the room, me and my brothers, very emotional scene, we were crying. We literally held arms together and we screamed, Abba, Ani Lo Yachol, I can't deal with this situation. I can't. You can do anything. And I'm relying on you to save my father's legs. This coming year, Rosh Hashanah, Abba, we're relying on you to have my father stand again in the Mir Yeshiva and blow shofar as the Baal Tokea that he was there for the last 50 years. This year he's going to be there. On two legs. We took him out of the hospital. They were scheduling the amputation. I called my Rebbe in Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Rabinovich, Shalita. I said, Rebbe, the doctors is not the Mahalach, only Hashem. And ladies and gentlemen, please understand this. Bitachon means that I rely completely and only on Hashem. Hashem is not an also, He's an only. Please write that down. Hashem is not an also. It's not I also believe in God. No, that's not it. Hashem is an only. He's not an also. I only am relying on Hashem. He's the only one that can help my father now. I said, Rebbe, we're davening, we're giving siddaka, we're doing everything we can. He said to me, did you go for a second opinion? I said, a second opinion? I, 
No, we didn't. He says, I want you to go to a second opinion. I want you to go to somebody in the city. Go to the city. Go to Manhattan. Go to the city. It's okay. We call up one of these guys that know all the doctors. He gave us a name, Dr. Tadros. Mount Sinai Hospital. Supposed to be one of the top in his field. Kolakavot. Two days later, I drive my father out to the city. We're in Tadros' office. We're there with the scans and the MRIs. We came with the whole pack. The doctor looks at the MRIs. And he looks at my father and he says, Mr. Ben Susan, I'm sorry, but as I'm looking at the MRIs, all the six stents that they put in your leg are all clogged and closed completely. There's no way to reopen them. And because they put already six stents in your leg, there's no place left to put another stent. It looks like they might be right. I think the only thing left is amputation. But he says, but I want to tell you something. Just this week, I just got a new tool. It's this hydro tool that I got that no one really has yet. And I think that, and he starts pointing to the MRI. I was, I was in the room. He says, you see this stent? It's not as clogged and closed up as the other six. Maybe, maybe I might with this hydro tool be able to cut and clean through the stent and get some blood down to your foot. Maybe we might be able to save the foot. I would say he tells us it was about a 5% chance. I looked at my father and I smiled and I said, <laughs> you hear? He has a new tool. <laughs> He's going to use his new toys and he's going to open up the, uh, the stent. My father looks at the doctor and says, if you think there's even a chance, try. It's between that and the alternative. So, the next week they schedule the operation, a five hour procedure operation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. That night, I took out a Tehillim and I said, Abba, it's not Tadros, it's not his toy, it's not his hydro drill. He's a good man, but it's not him. I'm relying only on you. Ani lo yachol, ata kol yachol. I'm relying on you to save my father's leg. That's it, nothing else. I said, Abba, listen to me. Ani le dodi vidodi li. We're in the month of Elul, the month of mercy. I am on to my beloved, and my beloved is on to me. Abba, I'm relying on you completely. Please, come out and help us with this. And the next person that asks me for help, I will do whatever it is they need. Two-way street. I'm relying on you to go out and help me, and you... I'm going to throw someone at me to help them. We're going to get Yeshuot. If you want Yeshuot, go out and help somebody else. And then all of a sudden, God finds many good reasons to help you. Mida keneged mida. I'm relying on you. The next week, the operation, my brother Rabbi Avi from Lakewood, my sister Devari, they go out. And they're waiting in a five-hour waiting room for the operation to be done to find out if my father's leg could be saved. Maybe he can open one stent. At the end of five hours, Dr. Tadros comes out and he walks up to my sister and he says to my sister, that was only God. Now this is coming from the Goy, the Goyusha doctor. That was only God. My sister asked, what? Now, the doctor turns and says, what? <laughs> I thought we had a 5% chance to open one out of six stents. He says, I pulled out the hydro tool. I put it into the first stent and it opened up like butter. It cleaned and plowed through from the groin down to the ankle in one swift movement. He says, it went so easy, I went to the second stent. 
and I cleared out that one. And then I went to the third, and I cleared out that one. And I went to the fourth, and I cleared out that one. And then I went to the fifth and the sixth, and I cleared out all six stents. Now, says the doctor, I have a worry. Listen to the doctor's worry. Hashem is laughing at the doctor. Listen to the worry. He says, I have a worry. I'm scared. He might have too much blood flowing down to his foot. I'm going to have to put him on antibiotics because he has too much, you hear this? He has too much blood coming down to the foot. The foot was without blood for so long. Now that it has a Niagara Falls of blood coming down to the foot, we don't know what to do with it. I'm worried about infection. I got to put him on antibiotics because there might be too much blood coming down to the foot. Hodu ladonai kitov ki leolam hazdo. After that operation, my father's foot started healing. He has blood coming out of the bottom of his foot day and night, and we're all cheering it on. We never saw a sweeter sight of blood. And we say today, the Omar Lach Bedamai Hai. The Omar Lach Bedamai Hai. And the Rashiv of the Mir Yeshiva called him three days after the operation. Rabbi Yitzchak, are you coming to blow shofar in the Mir Yeshiva again this year? This is year 50. He said, yes, and I will be standing on both feet. Hashem, you did this. Nobody else but you. Because we relied on no one else but you. You came through for me. I'm going to come through for you as well. Two days later. <laughs> this is great. Two days later, I get a letter from Torah Communications. Torah Communications is a dial-up phone system that has all different rabbis' classes. You know, in the olden days, we used to listen to that before all the fancy stuff on the laptops, but I still have that because I'm still the dinosaur that walks around with a flip phone. So I have that dial Torah, Torah Communications, and I still, till today, listen to it. You know, the oldies but goodies. I'm not talking about songs. I'm talking about Rabbi Fran, Rabbi Pesach Kronia. I, I, that's who I grew up with, those twin, two ta- twin towers. And I enjoy them till today. So Torah Phone sends me this paper. And listen to what it says. On the top it says, One of our very Hashiva rabbis just had a terrible loss. Now, you know, some of us, especially myself, we get a lot of these papers. We don't know who, where, what. We don't know, yeah, no. You know, so we send $18 we don't know. We don't know who, what, where. If we knew the situation better, we would give much more. So I said to myself, okay, it's another situation. But then I stopped. And I saw that the name of the rabbi on the top of the paper was my Rosh Yeshiva from the Yeshiva of Yeshivat Itri that I learned in, in Eretz Yisrael 27 years ago. I said, oh my gosh, that's my rabbi. I haven't spoken to him in 27 years. What, what, what loss did he incur? What happened here? So I start reading the rest of the paper. Instead of tossing it, I start reading it. And I see the paper says that this rabbi, my Rosh Shiva, he just lost his son-in-law in COVID. And his son-in-law left over an almana, which is the rabbi's daughter, and 10 children at home, 10 yitomim. And now all the financial burden fell on the grandfather, my Rebbe, the father of this girl, who now is almana. And they're crying out for help. And then I looked at the name of my Rebbe's son-in-law. His name was Reb Chaim Tadros. I said, oh my, what's that? I said, one second. On the counter, I have the printout from Mount Sinai Hospital. Dr. Tadros, the one that did the initiation for my father's leg. The one that I said, Hashem, Hashem. Anila Dodi, Vidodili, come through for me. I'll always come through for you. The next one you send me, I'll be there. He extended me credit because I relied on him with absolute bitachon, made a miracle through Dr. Tadros on the operating table to give my father's leg back. Two days later, I get a little mail, my Rosh Yeshiva, of my Yeshiva, Lalenu. He lost his son-in-law, Reb Chaim Tadros. How many people 
do you know named Tadros? Now, I, I don't know that many. I don't know, maybe you know, not my our circles, maybe other circles. But I said, I'm looking at both papers on the counter. Dr. Tadros, Reb Chaim Tadros Zatzal. I said, okay, I got the message. I call up Torah phone and I say, could you put me in contact with my Rosh Hashiva? I haven't spoken to him in 27 years. They said, yeah. I said, no, no, I'm going to give a, believe me, I'm going to give a good donation. Just please. Could. Ten minutes later, they get my Rosh Hashiva on the phone. I tell him the story. And I asked him, your son-in-law, where did he get the name Tadros? I mean, I, I, I know a doctor, Tadros, but he's not even Jewish. How did he end up with Tadros? He says, I want to tell you. My son-in-law, he comes from a very special family, but the family was completely wiped out in the Spanish Inquisition. And there was only one or two people that survived, and the name was Tadros. I said, Rebbe, what do you think? Is this Hashgacha? Is this Hashem talking straight to me and you? Anili dodi vidodili. Hashem says, I'm ready to take up your fight. I'm ready to take up your cause. I just want to connect with you. Because if we can connect, I'll fight for you. And then Elul turns from Anil Dodili Dodili to Echat Lemala Visheva Lemata. And with this Echad Lemala, we can knock out all the seven names, Sheva Lemata, wipe out all this Yetzer Ara that's been troubling us all years. Come to a Yom Adin clean. Come to a Yom Adin with an unbelievable year ahead of us. But maybe even more so. Come to a Yom Adin with a closeness to Abba. Because once you taste an absolute bitachon experience like this, you feel someone holding your hand. That experience is priceless. Hashem should bless all of us. Ktiva v'chatima tova v'shana tova amborechet. Rabbi, nobody's moving. Can you give us <laughs> three more minutes? <laughs> yeah, three more yeah, minutes. Yeah. Three more minutes. Good. Please, three more minutes. <laughs> my, my, my three minutes means 20 minutes. No, 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 Rabbi. I, on the way over here, ladies and gentlemen, the rabbi told me that the kolel is flourishing here in the shul and in the community. You know, we're talking here about a procedure that was able to save the artery of my father. A kolel is a heart transplant for a community. It continues to just pump and pump greatness, direction, and Torah to everybody in the community. These guys, many of them are super talented. They can go out and make themselves probably all types of wonderful lives for themselves. But one day, somebody reached these Kolel guys and told them, they whispered into their ear and said, life is not about you, it's about Klal Yisrael. So they put aside all financial aspirations. They put aside all the grandeur of what maybe people would find in different ventures of life, and they said, I'm here to serve instead. These are guys that show up every day and they give their hearts and souls to the community. They are the pillars of a flourishing community. All the blessing that's gonna come out comes down to them and then it spreads out to everybody else. They are that magnificent tsinor. They're that magnificent tunnel or funnel or pathway that brings down blessing to communities. Let's be mechazik this kolel and the rabbis. I want to tell you something. This past uh, January, I spent my midwinter vacation here in Florida. I was a little bit in Sunny Isles. I was down by uh, Surfside, and I came here as well. Uh, we spent a uh, Arbit together here with the, with the rabbi. You walk around Florida, and you say, wow, this is great. I heard that the ex-governor, Governor Cuomo, got the award for the top real estate agent in Florida. He's the reason <laughs> why, why, why so many people <laughs> are coming down to Florida to be able to find what is here a magnificent, a beautiful community. Hashem shall bless this community. 
The leadership that you have is unbelievable. The people that you have is so warm. Not just in the climate, I'm talking about the people are warm. Let's build this yeshiva, let's support this kolel, and let's realize that Be'ezat Hashem, Mashiach comes. He's gonna come right here to Aventura and find a young generation that's finally waiting for him.